Apollo astronauts spent just a few hours on the moon before heading home. SpaceX's Starship HLS changes everything. It's designed to keep crews alive for an entire month on the lunar surface. So what's the breakthrough that makes this possible? The vehicle stands 50 meters tall with life support systems, an elevator, and interior volume 200 times larger than Apollo. It can carry four astronauts plus rovers, cargo, and tons of scientific equipment to build Moon Base Alpha at the South Pole. But how do you survive where there's no air to breathe and temperatures swing 300 degrees? The answer lies in completely rethinking what a lunar mission can be. The Apollo lunar module stood 7 meters tall, weighed 15 tons, and carried exactly two astronauts for just hours on the surface before lifting off. Every component ran on hypergolic propellants, nothing was reusable, and each lander was abandoned after one use. Starship HLS changes that equation entirely. Standing 50 meters tall with a landing mass between 100 and 150 tons, this vehicle isn't just bigger, it's a different category entirely. The pressurized cabin has 200 times more space than the Apollo Command Module, enough to theoretically hold 100 people, though it's designed for four astronauts. It comes equipped with an elevator system, extensive life support, and supplies to keep crews alive and working for 30 days straight. That's not a visit anymore. That's setting up operations. This is where NASA and SpaceX start disagreeing. NASA wants speed because they're focused on beating China back to the moon. But Elon Musk keeps asking the same question. Didn't we already win that race 57 years ago? His perspective is clear. A permanently crewed lunar science base would be far more impressive than repeating what Apollo already accomplished in 1969. That vision has a name. Moonbase Alpha. The location matters as much as the vehicle. SpaceX is targeting the moon's south pole, where the terrain is brutal, but the resources are rich. Water ice sits trapped in permanently shadowed craters, something Apollo's equatorial sites never had access to. When HLS touches down vertically, crews descend via elevator with support robots, rovers, construction equipment, and scientific instruments. They start assembling modular habitats near the landing site while living inside the HLS itself, which provides oxygen, food, water, exercise equipment, and radiation protection. Additional starships arrive on subsequent missions, some landing vertically for crew transport, others potentially landing horizontally to become permanent base modules. Each flight brings more equipment and capability, the base grows piece by piece. But making this work requires solving problems Earth-based construction never faces. Landing creates the first major challenge. Rocket engines firing near the lunar surface kick up massive plumes of sharp, abrasive dust. With no atmosphere to slow it down, this regolith shoots out like shrapnel, capable of damaging anything nearby. Engineers calculate that vehicles need to land at least 70 meters from existing structures, or protective barriers must be developed that shield infrastructure while blocking cosmic radiation. This constraint shapes how the entire base gets laid out. Power generation determines what's possible. Solar panels integrated into each starship provide electricity for daily operations and communication through Starlink systems. But energy-intensive processes like extracting oxygen from lunar soil require far more. The long-term solution needs a nuclear power plant on the moon, which sounds extreme until you calculate what it takes to keep humans alive in vacuum. Food production starts with packaged meals from Earth while crews establish greenhouse modules. NASA has selected specific crops for lunar conditions, watercress, lettuce, tomatoes, potatoes, chosen for growth rate and nutritional value under artificial lighting. Protein comes from 3D bioprinting technology that produces lab-grown meat, already being tested by several agencies for long-duration missions. 
Oxygen proves more straightforward than most expect. Each astronaut needs 0.8 to 1 kilogram daily, meaning a four-person crew requires 5 to 10 kilograms every day. Lunar regolith contains abundant oxygen locked in mineral compounds. The extraction method uses carbothermal reduction, heating regolith with carbon at 1,500 to 1,700 degrees Celsius releases oxygen as capturable gas. NASA has already demonstrated this works using actual Apollo samples. The process demands massive energy, reinforcing why nuclear power becomes essential. There's a critical bonus here. The same oxygen extraction also produces liquid oxygen propellant for rocket engines. This matters for Mars missions because round-trip fuel requirements exceed what any spacecraft can carry from Earth. Proving oxygen production on the Moon validates the technology needed to refuel deep space vehicles, turning the lunar base into a stepping stone for interplanetary travel. Water follows similar logic. Advanced filtration systems recycle every drop, including urine, purifying it to drinking quality, just like the International Space Station does continuously. The moon has water ice deposits, but accessing them presents difficulties. Ice sits in permanently shadowed craters at some of the coldest temperatures in the solar system, buried one to two meters underground with no sunlight for power. Solar-powered robots offer the safest extraction method, drilling into regolith and processing what they find. Base layout applies construction principles from Earth-scale projects. Geographic information systems analyze terrain and divide land into functional zones, landing pads, cargo handling facilities, maintenance bays, scientific laboratories, mining operations, power generation, crew habitats, greenhouses, and recreation areas. These zones connect through rover roads while buried trenches carry power cables, data lines, and fuel pipelines between facilities. Radiation shielding protects habitats, while blast walls guard critical systems from landing plume damage. Redundancy prevents single points of failure. Multiple landing pads keep operations running if one is damaged or occupied. The timeline depends on perspective. NASA pushes for 2028, while SpaceX takes a more measured approach to engineering challenges. Even if HLS doesn't land until 2030 or China reaches the moon first, the competitive framing misses the point. This isn't about planting flags. It's about building infrastructure that lasts and opens the solar system for human expansion. Musk consistently emphasizes that the moon serves as a proving ground. The real destination is Mars, and lunar conditions provide the perfect test environment. Harsh vacuum, extreme temperature swings, and constant radiation exposure make the moon harder than Mars in many ways. Master survival there, and Mars becomes achievable. That's the strategic value of Moon Base Alpha, not as an end goal, but as the critical step toward making humanity multiplanetary. So here's where we stand. Fifty-seven years after Apollo proved humans could reach the moon, SpaceX is proving we can actually stay there. The difference between a few hours and a full month might not sound revolutionary until you think about what it enables. Those extra weeks mean building infrastructure, testing life support systems, extracting resources, and validating every technology needed for Mars. Every day spent at Moon Base Alpha moves us closer to becoming a multiplanetary species. Yes, there are delays. Yes, China might plant their flag first. But that entire framing misses what's actually happening here. We're not racing to repeat 1969. We're building the foundation for permanent human presence beyond Earth. The Apollo astronauts were explorers visiting an alien world. The crews heading to Moon Base Alpha will be settlers establishing humanity's first extraterrestrial home. The technology exists right now. Starship HLS is being built. The robots, the life support systems, the resource extraction methods, they're all in development. 
What separates us from this future isn't engineering capability. It's commitment. SpaceX has that commitment, and they're working around the clock to make this vision real. If you believe humanity's future extends beyond one planet, hit that like button and drop Go SpaceX in the comments. Your support matters because it shows there's an audience for ambitious space exploration. Subscribe to Atlas Space to follow every step of this journey as Moonbase Alpha goes from concept to reality. The countdown to permanent lunar habitation has already begun. Make sure you're here to witness it. The U.S. Space Force just approved two new Starship launch pads at Cape Canaveral. But here's what they're not telling you. This isn't for regular missions. SpaceX is building a military variant that towers at 150 meters, nearly 50 feet taller than anything flying from Starbase. It carries 2,650 tons of fuel in the ship alone and packs nine engines instead of six. What kind of military operation needs this much power? Why did the Space Force fast-track approval when similar projects took years? And what does this 150-meter monster do that makes it critical to national security? Let's start with where this is happening. SLC-37 launched Saturn YB rockets during the Apollo era in the 1960s, then served as home to ULA's Delta IV rockets until 2024. The plan was to abandon it. No one expected this legendary complex to see another rocket. Then SpaceX stepped in, leased the site, and in June began tearing down ULA's old towers. Six months later, the area was completely cleared and the final environmental impact statement was approved. What caught everyone's attention wasn't just the approval, it was what the documents revealed about the Starship variant planned for this site. The upper stage stands 230 feet tall, about 70 meters. The super heavy booster reaches 263 feet, roughly 80 meters. Stack them together and you get 493 feet, a full 150 meters of rocket. That's taller than the Starship version 4 Elon mentioned at Starbase, which was supposed to top out at 142 meters. The environmental documents use the word expected for these dimensions, meaning nothing is final yet. But why would the Space Force approve plans for a rocket bigger than anything SpaceX has publicly announced? The approval process itself tells the story. When ULA wanted to certify Vulcan Centaur at SLC-41, the environmental assessment finished in 2019, but certification dragged on for over five years. Blue Origin sued NASA in 2013 over the LC-39A lease and lost after three months, delaying New Glenn all the way to 2025. Yet SpaceX got SLC-37 approved and cleared for construction in less 